I'm glad you're here if it's your first time here or if you're watching online, maybe you were invited. I want to start with some questions to get us kind of our, our minds thinking here. Have you ever wondered how we can effectively share the message of Christ in today's fast-paced, ever-changing world? Have you ever felt challenged by the thought of sharing your faith with a world that seems increasingly hostile and indifferent towards Christianity? How can I share my faith in this world where it seems as if everybody hates Christians? And the last question I want you to think about is what does the Holy Spirit, what role does the Holy Spirit play as we seek to share the good news with others? I want us to look at a story by a brother named Philip. Last week we mentioned Philip, a little bit of his ministry. We're going to rewind the tape a little bit more uh, because Philip does something. He encounters this eunuch from Ethiopia. He reveals kind of some profound insights that we can glean from and we can add to our lives when it comes to evangelizing today, being a light today. We can glean from how he did it. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 8. We're going to be in verse 26. If you don't have a Bible, I have one in the sky. If you're watching at home, it's on your lower third, I'm sure. Praise God. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. There was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning, seated in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was like this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? From his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. I taught the message today, succeeding in evangelism. How many of you want to be successful in your evangelism, right? You want to see converts. We want to see people kind of uh, go from lost to found, and, and it's, it's, it's important. But I think we can look at Philip's story and glean uh, and follow some of the principles that he used in, in conversating with this eunuch to us. And one of the first things that I want to point out is that when God speaks, we have to learn how to follow God's divine appointments. We have to learn how to follow God's divine appointments. God, set us, God sets it up, doesn't he? If you look at Philip, his encounter with this eunuch wasn't coincidence. It was a divine appointment orchestrated by God. And the Spirit prompts Philip to approach the chariot. First, the, the, the Spirit of God says, go down south. And Philip says, Sure. And then there is a chariot, and the Spirit said to him, go up to the chariot. And what we, what we notice is that Philip doesn't go, ah, I'm straight. I don't know. I'm tired today. I walked all the way over here. Do you want me to go? He didn't, the Scripture says he, he didn't even question, right? He didn't even, ah. it says when the Spirit of God said go up to the chariot, he ran. How many of us 
need to learn how to run when the Spirit says go. We like to drag our feet, don't we? Go talk to that coworker. Go pray for them right now. I don't know. They might not be open. They might rebuke. Sometimes when the Spirit says go, we need to go. We need to run. We need to get there immediately. So the, the, the obvious follow-up question is then, how do I know the Holy Spirit is talking to me? How do I know it's God and not me? So there are some things in the Christian faith that you can do to sharpen your spiritual ears, to sharpen your spiritual senses. There are some disciplines that you can add to your life if you haven't already, that you can have daily in your life. Because John 16, 13 says this, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He won't speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is to come. So what's the spirit? Holy Spirit is the truth. He comes to guide us. Excuse me. So as you spend time in Holy Spirit with, with God in prayer, this is how you can sharpen your ears a little bit. Real quick. Pray and listen. And you should have that in your daily life. Prayer and listening. You hear me say, I'm a journaler. I love to journal. Why? Because I like to listen to what God says. <clears throat> in fact, the other day, excuse me, I go to pray. And the Lord said, Grab your, grab your journal and sit down. I was like, okay. And I just started writing what I was hearing him tell me. And I had no words back, just listening. Then another day, I was praying nonstop. So this, th this relationship is about communication, and what it does is it sharpens your ears to hear what God sounds like. And, and, and another way you can do that, look at Proverbs uh, chapter 3. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart, Lean not on your own understanding. You guys know this. In all your ways, submit to him. He will make your path straight. Another way you can sharpen your spiritual ears is study and meditate on the scriptures. God speaks through his word, doesn't he? So how do you know if it's the Holy Spirit if you don't know his word? How can you discern? See, the devil knows the word of God too. <coughs> So we got to know what God says in his word. And so you got to meditate on scripture. Allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate the scriptures to you, to spend time to teach you. Scripture says he's the teacher. So as you're learning the teaching habits of the Holy Spirit, as you're learning the guiding and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, by spending time with the Holy Spirit, you're, you're sharpening your spiritual ears to hear when the Holy Spirit says go or stop or yes or no. You're learning this in the secret place with him. You're sharpening those things. We know the word of God is important. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. So your word is a lamp to my feet. Next step, light to my path. Let, Holy Spirit, what do I do? How do I move? What should I say? Where should I go? Holy Spirit, remind me. And James teaches us to not only just be merely listeners of the word, because we deceive ourselves if we think, oh, I heard the word today. I heard the message today, but we ought to be doers. We ought to do what it says. Amen? So if you do these just those simple things, you start to cultivate the ability to hear the Spirit of God when he says, go talk to this person. You'll know it's God. And this is kind of, sometimes it's trial by error. You go up to someone and they, you know, re they, they reject you. And you're like, man, I knew I didn't hear God. No, the Bible says rejoice if you're rejected for the gospel's sake, for my name's sake. They rejected the prophets before. They're going to reject you too. Right? It's about obedience. So we see Philip. He follows God's divine appointments. The next thing that we can learn from him is we need to learn how to use contextual engagement. So Philip, he engages the eunuch. He starts with what the eunuch is reading. Where are you at? What are you reading? How many times I can remember me being at the airport or being at a coffee shop and I'm reading a book and somebody comes up to me, hey, what you reading? Why? Why do they want to know what I'm reading? Because they want to engage in the conversation. And when they ask me, I'm like, hey, I'm reading this. And, da -da -da -da. and it just opens up conversation. My wife is very good at this too. When we go out, I remember one time we did a family vacation at Disney and, and um, she just uh, has this ability to 
to engage people like this culturally. Like the mom, she's like, we're on the bus. It's like, how are you doing today? You doing good? Hey, do you know? It starts asking questions, and the mom get the mom talking. And by the end, she's praying for the lady, and the lady's crying. <laughs> I'm like, that's amazing. You have like an ability to understand context and engage people within their context. And this is, this is important because he gives us the understanding of understanding the background of the individual he was ministering to. We got to stop just preaching at people and understand who they are. They are an individual. They have a different context, a different background, a different view on the, the worldview is probably different than yours, right? It's not your worldview that we're trying to preach. It's his worldview. It's the kingdom, Amen. kingdom of God. <coughs> so, excuse me. We got to follow Philip's example. Here's some scriptures to support this thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. It's the idea of understanding context and uh, people's backgrounds. He's not saying that I compromise and sin. He goes, look, I just understand people and I want to I, I connect with people. I want to relate to people. I remember uh, as a young youth pastor, I had these two kids in my youth group. Now, the dynamic of the youth group, there were some, they were rockers, kids that, looked, you know, had the skater whip hair, you know, this, <laughs> the skater whippers, you know. <laughs> and then you had, you know, the kids with the cornrows and, you know, you know, just go it up. It was like those kind of people. It was like split. But then there was these two kids that I love to this day. They're my spiritual kids. They were emo. I mean, Janko jeans, big long chains, <laughs> mascara, spike bracelets. They just stood out. And they were like, you know, they were like, <laughs> <laughs> they just stood out. And you're like, all right, they're different. Praise God. And no, everybody was afraid of them. So they, they were the group that listened to Christian death metal. Did you know that there's Christian death metal music? I work out to it. It's awesome. Jesus, right? <laughs> it'll, it'll make you put up that heavy weight, I'm telling you. But I learned that from them because I started realizing, okay, I got to connect with these. I got to understand them. I'm not going to try to change them to stop wearing their Jenko jeans and their chains and stuff. I gotta, I'm going to try to connect with who they are. And uh, after conversating, we got liking to music, and I realized these kids... Man, they, they love Jesus. They want to know who Jesus is. They just, they just dress different, and they're just a little bit different. I'm not going to convert them to wear khakis and polos because I don't see that in Christianity. <laughs> you can't come to church dressed with mascara. Bro. No, but uh, just I've, I've seen um, the benefit of trying to understand context. I've also seen the benefit of not trying to understand context and the wounds that that can cause on people too trying to force feed them to fit a certain mold. Colossians chapter 4 says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. That means those outside the faith. Make the most of every opportunity that your conversation always be always full of grace, seasoned with adobo <laughs> or laris so that you may know how to answer Everyone, when we speak, right? Be wise with those outside the faith. Acts chapter 17, this is an example of that. Paul, he stood up in the meeting of Aero, uh, Pegasus, and he said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. For I walked around, I looked carefully at all your objects of worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So what did Paul do? He used contextual engagement. He understood the, the context of what was going on in Athens. He understood the type of people he was talking to. He even used what they would use as worship, and he turned it for the gospel. We got to get good at understanding people's stories and turning it for the gospel. Context, right? Amen? Here's another thing that we, that we see that Philip did. And not only did he run up to the side of the, the chariot, that the Lord told him to. He's following this divine appointment, following the leading of the Holy Ghost. And then he says, what are you reading? He's understanding content, and he's hearing the information. Isaiah, oh, how, how am I supposed to understand this? And he's like, come on up, right? 
And when he gets on up, here's what we can glean. We got to have clarity of message. Paul had, uh, Philip had clarity of message. He was able to take where he was in Isaiah and through Scripture walk him through and point to Jesus. That's awesome. It's a very simple, very easy way to share the gospel to this eunuch. It serves as a model for effective evangelism, using the Scriptures as a foundation for the message. We don't got to rely on eloquence. It's not about persuasion. It's not about, hey, look, you know, if you do these three things, it's not about being fancy. <coughs> the word of God is enough. It's a great place to say amen. amen. Sometimes the word of God is so simple, we don't think it's enough. Why? Because we're inundated with so many messages that are so uh, creatively crafted and marketed our way to get us to buy things every day. And, and us, he rolls again three days later, and all who believe shall be saved. That's it? It's a simple gospel. I mean, you can, you can add theological stuff to it all you want, but the very simplistic picture is that we needed a Savior, and Jesus came and died on that cross, took the punishment that you deserved and I deserved, and rose again three days later. Simple. And he sent his Holy Ghost to dwell on the inside of us. Come on. That's us Pentecostals. Hallelujah. We ain't afraid of Holy Ghost. So if you heard people singing in tongues today, you're like, what in the world? Well, that's what we are we about that life, okay? But, but preaching the gospel doesn't require you to be eloquent. I don't know enough yet. I don't know how to argue. It's not, we're not talking about apologetics. We're just talking about the simple, sharing the simple gospel. And let me tell you, that is enough. That is enough. Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Faith comes by hearing, right? Hey, this is what happens. You, you share the scriptures. You share the word of God, and faith starts rising up. It's not your creative slogans and how you're going to share faith with people. Look at my story. Your story is a part of it, but your story is not it. That's why I encourage people, when you share your testimony, you know, I'm used to people sharing, when you hear somebody share their testimony, it's 90% about them and 10% about Jesus. I think we ought to flip that. 10% was like, man, I was a horrible person. I did this, that, and whatever, you know. But Jesus, Jesus saw and changed my heart, right? That should be our, our testimony. Faith comes by hearing. 1 Corinthians 2. Paul says, when I came to you, I did not... Come with eloquence or human wisdom as proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I believe that if you want to be effective in your evangelism, Make sure that you're not trying to win people to you, but you're pointing people to Jesus. Because charismatic people, you run the risk, because I'm charismatic, so we can run the risk of drawing people unto ourselves. That's not our goal. Our goal should be, it's not about me, it's about him. Right? Second Timothy says this, Paul says this to Timothy. Preach the word. Everybody say, preach the word. Preach the word. What's the word? The gospel, come on. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. I ought to be able to have a microphone like this and go, here, preach the word. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I don't have a message. Yeah, you do. The gospel. Preach the word. Here's the mic. Preach the word. Here's the mic. Be ready in and out of season. Come on. To correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience, careful instruction. Preach the word. One time. This was probably the highlight of my ministry career as when I was a youth pastor. I was kind of giving hints leading up. I was preaching a gospel series like this, and I was kind of giving hints to the teenagers and, and the young adults. I was saying, man, you guys, this is not my show. This is about Jesus. And I remember this, this, this day so, so amazingly. I put a slide up. I had a picture 
but it was actually a video. It was a video that a buddy of mine and I made where I was kind of walking through the city, and it's kind of like all these cool music because you got to have that sometimes with kids to get their attention. And basically it showed me sharing my faith, and then it stopped, and there was an empty microphone in the middle of the street. And then on the screen it said, it's your turn. And so normally I would get up and I would preach. But what I did was I intentionally walked from the back. I waited. I walked from the back. I grabbed my Bible and my notebook. I sat in the front row, opened up my Bible, and had my notebook like this. And for about two minutes, they were like. And in my head, I'm like, oh, my. Let's see. Here we go. And I kid you not. One after another, after another, after another, we're coming up with the script with their Bibles and preaching the gospel. And I was like, let's go! That's what it's about. Preach the gospel. We got to get like that, guys. We got to be willing. We have to have a clear message. Here's the next thing that we can glean from Philip. When you preach the gospel, expect responsive hearts. When you share the simple gospel, do you expect a response? I do. I do. Now, I know we grew up in a culture where there's an altar call. Many come forward. You know, I'm not, sh I'm not shutting down the altar call. You know, but the altar call is not the evidence of a converted heart. It's not. It really isn't. I've prayed for hundreds and hundreds of people and seen them weep and cry. And then the next day, they, you don't see them anymore. They forgot about everything. Right? I've seen God do powerful things not only at the altar, but I've also seen him do powerful things right there in your seats and on videos. <laughs> I remember at times in my faith when I was going to give up and I'm putting on whatever faith channel was up, TBN or something, and some random person is preaching and I'm on my floor like, hoo, 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 you knew, you knew. I wouldn't advocate for the doctrine, but whatever they were saying was hitting me hard. Right? I expect responsive hearts Philip, using the scriptures, was drawing this eunuch to a real realization that Jesus is Lord. And we got to trust the Holy Spirit with these divine appointments that God puts in us, that he's already working in their heart. That he's already doing a work in their heart. John 6 says this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. I will raise them up in the last day. So, if you have a divine appointment with someone or you're sharing your faith with someone, it's not up to you whether they're going to get saved. You can't save anyone. You're not a savior. You don't have a heaven or a hell to send anyone to. Only Jesus does. Let that sit. You can't save anyone. They're not your disciples. <laughs> they're his. He saves we are just ambassadors and messengers. We stand and say, we know a Savior. He saved us. He can save you too. You don't have to go to hell because Jesus paid the price for your sins. All you got to do is believe. And I'm here as evidence of it. Come on. That's it. That's the simplistic thing. No one can come to the fire. So you got to trust. Okay, God, if they have a responsive heart, praise God. Acts chapter 16. This is another scripture. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord, who opened her heart? The Lord opened our heart. The Lord opens the heart. The Lord sees the heart of man, not us. Romans 10, again, says faith comes from hearing the message, right? And then 1 Corinthians 3. This is something you got to understand when it comes to modern evangelism. I planted the seed, Paul says. Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. You see that? I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. This principle for evangelism is like this. Our job, my job here even as a pastor, even as a Christian, whenever I'm sharing my faith, whenever I'm sharing the gospel, is to just throw seeds out. And, and if you follow the parable of the sower, what Jesus taught was simply this, that some seed is going to fall on good ground. God brings the increase. You understand? This is why I don't get discouraged when I preach, whether that's the five in a room or 50 in a room or 500. I don't, because I'm not moved by that. My job is to just throw the seed out. 
and believe that it's going to take root in hearts. But I do know that one-fourth of the room, according to that parable, and another, it'll take good ground. Now, as a man of God, I can't worry about that. What's going on in your heart? I can't. Neither can you. We have to sow seed in the hearts of people and trust that God is the one that's doing the work. Amen? We could expect God to do it, not you. Expect God. We see that. Then, we are, then another thing we can glean is after Philip kind of has this conversation and leads them through the scriptures and faith is built and expectations arise, we can see that the eunuch gets like, hey, there's water right there. I want to be baptized. Oh, th is there an amber alert? Thank you so much. Is it a child? Father, we just pray right now for this child. Father, we don't know what's going on right now, but we pray for divine intervention. We ask you right now in the name of Jesus, Father, to, to help the uh, police and those tracking that vehicle to be found in Jesus' name. And no weapon formed against that child will prosper. Lord, let the plans and the schemes of the enemy be come to naught. In the name above every name, in the name of Jesus, no, 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 no place to hide, no place to run, God. We pray your divine protection in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we need to learn how to help promote action. So Philip, he, he says, let's, let's go. Let's baptize you. They find the water. They start baptizing you. Listen, the whole point of evangelism is obedient action. It's to respond to the word of God. So somewhere clearly, Philip in his conversation said, Listen, not only is there salvation, but baptism is important too. Now, why is baptism important? Well, culturally, baptism wasn't only exclusive to Christianity. There were people would get baptized into all kinds of different things. So, but it was kind of like a, a, a declaration of, of who I am now in Christ. And so he says, I want to do it. I'm ready. I want to obey what the word says. Amen? Billy Graham once said, uh, after his crusades, he said, I would have done a lot less crusades and a lot more discipleship. Because we've seen millions come to the faith in Billy Graham's crusades. But one of the weakest things, and, one of, and, and he would attest to this, I, don't, I, I still got to look up the quote, I meant to do it in between services. But, but someone said, I believe it was him, but somebody said, it's like having babies and leaving them in the alley and walking away. We wouldn't do that naturally. But sometimes when you are... Uh, uh, preaching the gospel and people are getting saved and you don't follow up with actions of obedience. It's just the same idea. Spiritual babies being left there. Hope you survive. Discipleship. We are called to go and make disciples, not just stand and shout at people. Right? And so Philip helps him along the way. Let's go get baptized then, brother. That's your next step of obedience. Let's obey God. Let's go do it. Amen? Acts chapter 2 it says, Those who accepted his message were baptized. So, look, accepted his message, were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Romans 6 We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Ephesians 2, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we got we to gotta help promote obedience. Everybody say obedience. obedience. So looking at Philip, looking at his story, um, looking at how he approached the, the, the eunuch, I think we can honestly trust that, okay, God, what divine appointments do you have in my life? Who am I running into? Who have you set me up to talk to? 
I can't tell you all the times that I can't even say that every time that God, I knew it was a divine appointment that I stood up boldly and said, let me share the gospel. You know, sadly, I was afraid most of the time of maybe people's opinions on what they would say. Or maybe I just was quiet and just wanted to kind of hide in the crowd. I remember one time I was a, I was a cook for the Olive Garden and, um, you know, no one knew I was a Christian, I'm at least at least by me carrying my Bible in the line. I wasn't doing any of that. I was just going to work, putting my head down, working, and going. And somewhere along the line, somebody figured it out because people started pulling me in to the break room to pray for them. Hey, can you pray for me? I'm like, yeah, sure. Sometimes people would ask me, hey, let's get together. And I knew what they were asking. Let's get together. Let's connect. And they're sinners beyond sinners beyond sinners. And I'd be like, yeah, nah, I ain't. And I would never do it. Shame on me. Missing divine opportunities. I've learned how to yield to the Spirit of God. Clearly this person needs help. Clearly this person needs hope. Help me to be that. Help me to understand them. Help me to empathize with them. Help me to understand their story. Not make them like me, but help me to make them like you. What would you do in this story, in this situation? That whole old uh, 2000s WWJD, right? That's still a powerful thought in application to our life. Would Jesus just walk by the person that's broken? Every day we see them, they're broken. Every day we see them, it just comes out of their mouth. They're confused. They're lost. Would Jesus not even pray for them? I think he would. Could we learn to be like Jesus? Amen? Here's some real quick points of uh, application. These five things, and we'll wrap up. What can we glean? We need to learn to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. You ever, um, be, oh, have you ever been in a large crowd growing up, everybody's shouting, but you hear your mom's voice out of them all, and they say your name? Man, I used to play outside in the playground, in the projects where I grew up, and there were hundreds of kids just running around playing tag, you know, just shouting, throwing, Ohio well, had Buckeyes, the worthless nut. It just, we just used them to throw them at each other. I don't know why. We were bored, right? So just us just running around and throwing stuff at each other and just having fun. Everybody shouting and yay. And one of my friends, uh, his mom, I mean, she lived on the other side of the projects, and she would say his name, Lisito! <laughs> and we'd be all over here, and we'd hear the, oh! <laughs> Not even the full name, just a, oh! <laughs> and you'd see him booking it home. Like he knew. That's my mama. I can discern. I forgot to clean my room. My mom was like that too. And some days I would ignore it. You know, she called me Chulo because that was my nickname growing up. Oh, Chulo! I'm like, hey, I'm going to hide over here in this side of the thing. And I'd pay the price because <laughs> I didn't clean my room or do my homework or whatever the case might be. I was sensitive. My ears were in tune to, to, to my parents. As you know, as you, we, I, I, we got to get in tune. I have to get in more in tune with the, to the Spirit of God. When he says, hey, son, go. I know it's you, God. I know it's you. Can I submit this to you real quick? If the Holy, if you're sensing that God is telling you to share your faith with someone and you're trying to discern whether it's God or not, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it probably is God. Because do you think the devil wants you sharing your faith? <laughs> no. It probably is God. And if you get nervous, your hands are sweating, you're real nervous, uh, 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 just remember the simple gospel. All right? Just see where they're at. Ask them questions. Get to know them. And step into that moment with such courage 
Why? Because it's not about you. It's about them and Jesus. You're given the major introduction. Amen? So we got to learn to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our efforts. Don't just go and do evangelism if the Holy Spirit's not leading you that day. Maybe he's telling you, you need to chill a little bit, relax. You're making it about you, right? Another thing that we need to do is to remember to be culturally relevant. You're not, and what I say this is, you're not trying to make people like you. You're trying to make them like Jesus. So just because they don't look like you, talk like you, walk like you, doesn't, you don't have to change them to be like you. And I said this earlier, I'll say it again. You don't have to wear khakis and polos in church. Come as you are. Come as you are. Amen? Amen. The next thing we can learn from Philip and apply to our lives is to have clarity in our communication. Get good. Get gooder. Get gooder at communicating the gospel. I challenge you with homework. I challenge my life group leaders as well. Write down the simple gospel the way you would share it. Write it down. Do you know it? Write it down. You'd be surprised on how much you know or what you don't know about the gospel. And where there's holes in it, Talk to a brother or sister to help decipher you along the way so you can figure out what the gospel message is. Amen? Because we want to be clear. Listen, I work for Kirby Vacuums. How many of y'all got a Kirby in your house? Yo, Kir- Kirby's, man, those things weigh 6,000 pounds. <laughs> but they clean your curtains. They clean. They, I mean, I was a car. I did it for about two weeks, right? Because it, it was a little bit too much for me. I sold like 12 of them, though, all to my family. <laughs> I apologize to my family to this day because, you know, they're, that's like a, they in debt because of me. It's a $1,200 vacuum, you know. Anyway, but I remember they would teach me how to sell the vacuum, how to rebuttal every argument. You want to know what was the... the the seal, the way I sealed the deal, you can take the vacuum apart and make it a handle and just go vacuum. You mind if I vacuum your mattress? I'll show you. And then you just, and you have these pads and it would just, because it's that skin cells and it, it would just pull that stuff up and the, the white pads would become black and they would go, ooh! <laughs> now, if you have this vacuum, you can clean your, it, it'll take it all up. How much do you want? How much can you afford, right? Horrible. <sighs> brother, was, brother was struggling. I was just trying to find a job. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> so they teach you all these techniques to sell a vacuum. They used to have huddle meetings in the mornings. They would play techno music like praise music. Ooch, 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 ooch. You can do it. Go, go, sell, sell, go, go, sell. You can achieve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guys are like, yeah, yeah. Everybody's like, yeah. And I'm like, what in cult world is this? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> ooch, ooch, ooch. And it was like lights and DJ lights and stuff. Seven in the morning, you're like. <laughs> God, why do you have me here? <laughs> Believe me, it was a hard time in my life. <laughs> it's a low level. No, I'm sorry. If you were for Kirby, no, no shade, no shade. But for me, anyway, somebody's like, I'm never going to that church. Um, but if I can become that skilled in learning how to communicate how to sell a vacuum, can we not develop our skill in how to present the gospel? Can we sharpen it a little bit to share the most important message in the world? We're not salespeople. We don't have to be salespeople. We just got to know the simple gospel and share the simple gospel with people. Listen, no one else will do it but the church. God, I don't know why, in his, in his infinite wisdom, 
empowered his bride to go into the highways and the byways to preach the gospel. That's how he designed it. It is our job. It's not just the job of the pastor or the fivefold ministry gifts. It's everyone. We are all called to go and make disciples, every single one of us. Part of making a disciple is sharing the gospel. Amen? So we got to get clarity in our communication. Number four, we got to have some expectant faith. You got to trust God's power to transform hearts and lives. Is the simple gospel enough? Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your heart and believe in your mouth. Is it enough? I'll say yes, it is. Yes, it is. And then number five, have immediate, immediate obedience. If there's anything that I want you to learn is when the Holy Spirit says go, go. When the Holy Spirit says stop, you stop. Quick obedience. Amen? Amen. I remember sitting on my, in my living room couch when I knew back in Ohio that God was calling me for something else. Before I even came out here, I was sitting in my couch and I sensed the Holy Spirit say, move. And I was like, what? what? Spider? What? <laughs> he said, move. And I was like, that's all he said. I wrote it down. Okay, Lord. Move. Times, different prophetic words, times after time. I remember driving, going towards my house, and it was winter, and this old preacher was throwing salt down the steps in front of his church. I mean, he was probably in his 80s, and he's throwing salt down the steps, and I stopped at the light, and I looked over, and the Lord asked me a question. He said, who would this man give his church to? Because I still care about those sheep when he, when he retires. And I was like, I don't know. Not me. But I knew what he was asking of me at that moment. He was asking me to succeed someone who had no successor. And so then I went home, talked to my wife. I said, all right, Lord, you're moving things. You're making things happen. Okay, whatever. Long story short, the previous pastor here called my pastor back home and said, hey, do you have anybody? Because I need to retire. I don't have anyone. My pastor at first said no. And then eventually he called him back a week later, and my pastor said, yeah, I do have someone. Long story short, here I am. When, I, when the Holy Spirit says, move, move, it doesn't make sense sometimes. It doesn't make sense uh, naturally with resources. It doesn't make sense with a lot of things. But obedience is greater than sacrifice. So I pray that this week that you obey the Spirit of God, that you don't ignore the hurting people around you, that you share the gospel when you have the opportunity, and that you watch the power of the gospel change lives because there is still power in the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus. Amen? So I like Proverbs and I like James, the book of Proverbs and James because they're like quick summations, powerful uh, one-liners that you can kind of easily remember. So I'm going to give you a one-liner for today's message that you can kind of jot down, take a picture, remember it. In modern evangelism, let the Spirit lead, the Word guide, and obedience follow. For therein lies the power to transform hearts and bring forth salvation. It's all God's movement. It's just you obey. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you, God, for how they came to the faith, Father. I thank you, Lord, that they heard the gospel, that somebody somewhere was following your lead, being obedient, planting seeds in their journey, Lord, of faith and and, and, and parting that, and you watered, and another watered, and you brought the increase, Father, for those who call themselves children of God, Lord, they can attest and testify to this very thing. So, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would open our eyes to those around us, that we can do the same, and we can share our hope with them. Give us courage, give us boldness, help us to realize it's not about us, but it's about you. I pray for anyone else, God, who's outside the faith that says, man, I heard the word. I grew up in, around it. People have been planting seeds, and now my heart is burning. I'm, I need God in my life. What do I got to do? 
I pray, God, right now, wherever they are, that they would confess and believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on that cross for their sins, and you rose again. It's as simple as that, putting your faith in the work and the person of Jesus Christ. Surrender. Stop doing things your way. Grab a hold of him. I pray, God, for a great move of your spirit in this house, in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, the church says, amen. Amen. Why don't we stand to our feet this morning? God bless you. Hallelujah. Let's say this together. You ready? I am the head, not the tail. Above, not beneath. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Salt of the earth, light of the world. I will go. Take Jesus to all generations. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday, and we'll see you next week.